Hello and welcome to The Way of the Cross, a passion pilgrimage through song. My name is JJ Wright and I'm the director of the Notre Dame Folk Choir. Uh, we're so grateful for your presence today uh, in our second last episode. Uh, and we're so grateful for your participation in our entire series that started back uh, at the beginning of March. So uh, about two and a half months ago, we've been working together. Um, like I said, we have one more episode two weeks from today. Um, and we're very excited about that. Um, we'll get to uh, basically invite you on our pilgrimage with us. So we'll be able to capture some of the, the sights and sounds that we're seeing and uh, some of the music that we're recording in the studio too. Um, I just wanna thank our co-sponsors uh, for this series, the Mendoza College of Business, the Department of Theology, Campus Ministry, and the Notre Dame Alumni Association. I'd also like to invite you uh, at any point during our hour today to um, submit your questions. Um, the form for this is being shared in the chat right now. And at any point during our conversation, um, please feel free to, to ask away. We're glad to uh, interrupt ourselves um, at any point in our conversation to um, include you. And, um, and we'll definitely leave some time at the end as well um, to take some questions. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce again our conversation partners. Um, we're joined by Kim Belcher, Assistant Professor of Theology, sorry, Associate Professor of Theology. My apologies, Kim. Um, and uh, Constant Encourager, Kim Belcher. Um, we're joined by a uh, poet and librettist of the Passion, Tristan Cooley from Vermont. And uh, very excited today to have Meg Buter joining us, um, who joined us for an earlier episode. Uh, Meg is a rising uh, junior, rising junior, and um, uh, has been our uh, communications coordinator for the Folk Choir all this year. Um, and I know is very excited to travel to the Holy Land on Monday. So um, thank you guys for joining us. Um, and so today we're going to talk, uh, our title of our episode is called Memory and Mourning. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, and just try to dig into this concept um, but the basic gist of, of what we're hoping to uh, dig into today together is um, even in our the even in the Easter season, which we're currently in, uh, mourning and grief um, and kind of these these harder ideas are still present with us. Um, so, in my director letter, I talked about how the the liturgical calendar doesn't always line up with how we feel. Um, so Lent and Easter, Christmas, Advent, these all come on a schedule every year, but our sadness, our joy, grief, mourning, uh, they come to us potentially in a different rhythm. So um, today we'll talk about how um, entering into the liturgical year, entering into the mass gives us an opportunity to be met in these things, but, and, and to be seen um, in the things that we feel and the things that we experience, but also to be invited into a story that is bigger than us. The part, the, the reason why the passion and resurrection are so powerful is because Jesus waded into the muck. He experienced all the joys and horrors, horrors of life and died, but then rose and transformed who we can become. Um, so we're gonna start, start off here a little bit um, by talking about Easter in the folk choir, because it's one of those times um, both for myself and for the students where um, we kind of get this um, unreserved, uh, totally over the top experience of joy. And there's, there's kind of no one better to experience that with than college students. So I wanted to, to start off just by asking Meg, uh, you know, what is it like being a member of the folk choir at around Easter time? Yeah, um, it's definitely, like you said, um, unreserved joy. Um, and I think even um, as a first year student in the choir last year, um, people kept saying, oh, like, I know we have to, technically this year we're supposed to stay on campus for Easter. And I was kind of bummed about that because I wanted to go home and spend time with my family. And they were like, no, you'll love Easter with the choir. Um, and it was true. Um, we we start the day like the seniors playing this whole scavenger hunt in the morning and it's like you have to be a kid again um and experience easter in that way 
Um, so we run around campus and hopefully by that time it's warm. <laughs> um, so we get to feel the sunshine and um, definitely singing at mass this year was the first time I experienced being able to sing in the Basilica on Easter. Um, and the music we sing on Easter is just so jubilant. Um, and like being able to um, invite the congregation into that joy as well. Um, it's just really awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just like um, the, the whole day is such a huge celebration and it's kind of um, uh, capped by this uh, one tradition that I wanna share where the students make these paper mache eggs and they're filled with uh, confetti and they all circle up and then smash the eggs on each other's heads. It's like this uh, absolutely insane, but. Yeah, so last year, um, we technically do that for the people whose first Easter it is with the choir. So last year they were like, oh, we'll just all take a photo of everyone who's new. And so we all gathered in a line for the photo and then everyone was prepped behind us with the egg to crack <laughs> on top of our heads. And I was just like, overtaken um but then and then this year we did it again um and we were all just it's just like becomes like a like a water balloon fight kind of but instead it's with eggs and you're just like <laughs> with glitter and it's yeah it's a lot of fun and confetti so that's definitely another thing too where it's like oh I get to feel like I am a kid again I still am a kid <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we had this, uh, in, in preparation for today, we had this really wonderful conversation between the four of us. And, uh, and one of the things that Kim was talking about how uh, the liturgy is always going to ask something more of us. So uh, you can enter into the liturgy with an optimistic attitude and, and be totally positive and still the liturgy is going to ask more. You can enter into it with uh, completely desolate and and alone and the liturgy is going to welcome you in and and ask something more of you in that spot too kim i wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and what what's behind that or underneath that yeah um so obviously liturgy is um an experience that like really has a lot of emotional components um but it's not exactly an experience that's like here have these emotions at a specified time. So um, Good Friday is kind of a really good example of this because we think about Good Friday as a time to be really sad about Jesus's death on the cross. And I'm, that's not wrong. I mean, it's if, if you're really sad about Jesus dying on the cross on Good Friday, that's fine. But um, there's a whole variety of different emotional um, tones to Good Friday. And one of them um, that I think is a really interesting example comes from this traditional hymn, Vexilla Regius, which is a hymn about the triumph of the cross and like praising, it's, it treats the cross as the banner of Christ's victory over death. So that kind of, um, I guess, is a reminder to us that, you know, the liturgical life of the church is not about performing the proper emotions at a specified time and like feeling the way the liturgy you you think the liturgy is supposed to make you feel that day but rather it's about entering into a story um, of our life with God and with one another and that story is going to provoke a whole range of emotional responses for all of us and the liturgy actually makes room for us to have our own emotional responses in harmony with one another. Um, I think I spontaneously came up with the, the analogy of tuning. The liturgy tunes our emotional responses so that we can actually um, be together even though we don't all feel the same things. Yeah, Tristan, how is that, how is that kind of made its way both into your conception of like what performative passions are, of course, but also in specifically with the passion that we've worked on. Um, yeah, this, the notion of tuning is, is very apt um, because our passion, the composition process involves so many people over such a long period of time working on different scenes, which all have different sort of emotional requirements. Uh, or tonal requirements. There are different pitches that occur uh, in the crucifixion scene, for instance, versus the Last Supper scene. 
Um, and I might go through the course of a day in working on the writing where I would meet with different groups of students to work on scene four and the foot washing, the Last Supper, very intimate, very beautiful um, expressions of love. Christ, Jesus the man, Jesus the, per Jesus the friend. Uh, and then after, in the afternoon, I might work with Meg or another student, Hannah, um, to talk about Jesus on the cross, um, Jesus the reviled, Jesus the hated, Jesus the lied on. And so have to sort of go back and forth between those and to realize that um, it isn't as though I get to turn off one uh, or detune this string to then retune the other. Rather, it's uh, how can the tuning I experienced uh, in the first half of my day sort of resonate into the second part of the day. And I tend to think about this stuff sort of well, abstractly. I don't know how else to. But um, I, I would say that I found in writing, in particular, the crucifixion scene with Meg, that it was, it was incumbent upon us not necessarily to enter into a very dark state of mind or something to be able to do it. It wasn't required. We didn't have to, like, take ourselves there, um, but rather uh, summon to that scene or those, anything that was occurring and to recognize that there was actually a, a way in which everything would belong uh, in every scene. It was a matter of just staying with it until it kind of made sense. Yeah, when, when you were saying that, it made me think of... Uh... I've been I've been listening back through um, some of our performances of the Passion as we get ready for the recording session in a couple of weeks, and um, and the thing that really struck me kind of in this same vein was the chorus um, when Peter is kind of in the midst of retelling his betrayal of Jesus in the in the courtyard, and um, and if you sit and think about it and and sit with it, the the music. For this, the, the chorus is singing, I saw you in the garden, you were with him. I hear it in your voice. Uh, you cried, Lord, save me. They're accusing him, but the way that they're singing it um, and the way that Ike uh, Sturm and, and a couple of the students really kind of shaped um, the music for that section, like um, it's it presented in a completely different way than you would expect. You know, those those things are um, are charges, right? People are are kind of making their charge against them. And instead, the tone of the music, the tone of, of what we're trying to um, comprehend is really of heartbreak, you know? And, and kind of watching our friend and, and being able to sit with the fact that um, this has happened. I have it queued up here, so maybe I can play, um, play this little chunk. Oh, my screen sharing is disabled. If Kelsey, if you can fix that, I, I'd be glad to share it. Um, but, uh, Oh, there we go. Here we go. Give me one second. Forget my brothers. Our mission. He bestowed to heal. Can you hear it? Bringing oil for the sick and the sinners. We did these things. Tested demons with a staff. But I couldn't purge the one inside me. Oh Lord of hosts, restore me.
so yeah, this is a great example. And you know, we were just um, we were just in rehearsal this morning, uh, getting ready for our commencement mass and singing uh, Mozart's Ave Verum Corpus, which is such a beautiful setting of this uh, uh, medieval text by Saint Thomas of Saint Thomas Aquinas. Um, and it just it really kind of brought to the forefront like so much of what um, this music and music in general can do. It it can it can hold a paradox kind of right in front of your face. And part of what we as performers and uh, and performers of faith, I think, hope hope to be able to do is to um, find this ground where we're able to enter in emotionally to the degree that it's possible to be able to present um, the paradox and then thereby kind of inviting the audience into the contemplation of this with us. So as I'm getting ready for the session, I'm thinking about this, this uh, little chorus here. And one of my notes is we have to find a way to sing this like our hearts are breaking at that moment. Mm. This, and, and that, that idea of um, inviting people kind of into our own sort of subjective experience, but through the story of the scripture and through this sort of vehicle of our, our performance is, um, you know, it becomes like our, our dialogue between a performer, between artists, between congregation, between uh, brother and sister even, you know, it's an incredible uh, thing that we get to do. Yeah, and um, one of the things I really love about that scene, JJ, um, is the way that the accusations about Peter's failure then are juxtaposed with the memories of his like experiences with Jesus and with um, the disciples. And so it becomes like, it is heartbreak. It is because that's like his moment of repentance, but it's also the grounds for the, the um, community coming back together um, for them picking him up. Um, and for him, you know, returning to a love for Jesus um, and becoming the foundation for the future. Um, so I think that's actually, it's really, that scene is really beautiful to me because it's also like what, as Christians, like this is um, what failure means to us is like, this is also failure is what like returns us to remembering not just like who we are at the moment that we failed, but like our whole history with God and like being able to see that moment of failure in the context of that whole history as like a grounds for God's future work with us, mm. um, which I think is super powerful. Um, and it goes so far beyond Peter, but it's like, he's a really great example of that in the gospels. And I think the composition of that scene really, really pulls that out. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking something similar and it was, um, making me think of the crucifixion scene too. Um, just when we have that, the paradox between like, um, people like Mother Mary who are deeply grieving and maybe feeling some regret and some disconfusion and same with the, with the crowd and how we have the chorus, but they're also, you know, saying really angry things. And I remember Tristan and I, we were, I it was, that was the hardest part for me to figure out to put words to. Because I was like, I can't be angry. <laughs> I don't be sad about this, you know. Um, but you had to find where those two things met. And then my one of my favorite parts is when um, I think kind of like you were saying, Kim, um, when even through like it might seem like a failure that Mother Mary might feel like it was a failure or the crowd looking back, we might think, how could people condemn Jesus to death in such a terrible way? But then we come together and those melodies merge when we say, behold your mother, behold your son. And we're talking to each other um, and all of us. And we we find that um, forgiveness and empathy through, um, you know, the betrayal, the pain, everything. Um, so that's, it was reminding me of that moment in the, in the show too. Yeah. Yeah, I think. The, oh, go, go ahead, ahead JJ. <laughs> I was just gonna say the um, uh, as I um, kind of as we as we get ready to to go um, to Israel, um, what what are some of the um, 
I, all of us have been hard at work, of course, at um, kind of crafting what our pilgrimage is going to look like and kind of um, what each of our responsibilities are. So many details, right, to, to bring 60 people to the Holy Land. But um, I wonder if, if anyone might offer kind of um, what, what some of the other invitations that you found in the last couple of weeks um, as you've been um, trying to put yourself in that spot and, and put all of us in, in our own ways, our, our leaders on this trip as well. Um, so how, how has that been manifesting and, and how have you kind of um, been able to see that in your own experience here? Can I, can I start? Yeah, go for it. A, uh, a great gift in this process of coming up with programming in the Holy Land at the various holy sites and churches. And um, one of the great gifts of this experience for me has been getting the chance to write uh, specific devotions for each place. Prayers, litanies, processions, things to do as, uh, as a group, prayerful things to do as a group, um, small rituals to enact in place uh, that draw from the passion itself, this libretto, the work, uh, but that also um, uh, relates specifically to the history of the place and so it's been this for me I've had I've had this cool chance to integrate all these different elements and to create a devotional object but that then I when I'm there um, I having written them I feel as though I get to sort of hand it off to uh, another student to lead uh, hand it off to the community to then do what they want with and so they get to sort of that'll be great I don't know exactly how it will go but I, I do feel as though I've gotten to make a contribution and then now I get to step back and watch it um, breathe a little bit. Yeah. And uh, so, so that's been formative for me as a, as a poet. Is that, and this is also kind of what I hope to bring to all writing that I do in the future, which is, oh, you know, there's a point where you do stop. You know, there's a point where the, the poem ends and uh, now it's the job of a reader or whatever to interact with it. And then the poem either lives or thrives or sort of is abandoned or, you know, and that's, a, that's something I'm learning about. So I would say that this process has given me a window into what that feels like a little bit mm. better. Mm. Yeah, I think um, similarly to that, like for me now, it's the time to be able to, like I've been interacting with the poetry of our passion this whole year um over a year I guess but especially performing it but now I get to interact with it in the way of being an observer and like when we go to these places imagine the the scenes we've written about taking place you know and me being able to watch um and I'm really excited for our <clears throat> our small group discussions when we we dig into scripture that we'll have um on the the trip um and be able to sit and reflect in these places that may just seem like a place when we get there, you know, like, yeah. I don't think it'll look as grand as maybe <laughs> it seems like it would, you know, like this is, it's a sea and it's going to be beautiful, the Sea of Galilee, or this is where, you know, Peter's house was, but it might not really look anything like, you know, so I, I'm mentally preparing for that, that um, it, a lot of it is about how we enter into it spiritually. Um, and with one another and remembering too that we're not like this is a shared experience not just to mine with 60 of us but with everyone yes yeah I'll pick up on that um, you know just like one of the things that's interesting about pilgrimage is at least for Christians like the way we think about pilgrimage like what we're trying is to overcome time <laughs> mm. by overcoming space right so um, and I love what you've said there Meg because I think like in a way the work that you all have done on the passion is already like overcoming the the ways that time divides us sometimes from the origins of our faith and from Jesus Christ like in a way that you know I'm sure will add richness to like the way that you know we go to the Holy Land like in part like to return to the origin but that's like a it's a, it's a time divide. It's not a space divide. Mm. Um, and so there, there is going to be that sense of like, oh, this isn't anything like what it was like um, when Jesus was here. Um, and yet, 
I think one of the things that's really beautiful is that the generations of Jews and Christians who have worshipped there between Christ's time and ours have actually added to like our ability to pray um, in the places where Jesus was. Like even though it, you know, our we would love to have like a pristine time, you know, like uh, time machine experience. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, what you've done and what you're doing is actually going to be richer um, than that time machine experience. And that's something I think as modern Christians, like we always long to have a time machine and go back to the actual passion. And we have to be reminded that the um, the experience of receiving the tradition of Christ's passion from those who have gone before us and from those who are around us today is actually richer because it means being knit into Christ's living body, which is the church, um, which is better than just like, I mean, you know, the, the apostles saw the risen body on the beach and they didn't know who it was. Right. So the ability to recognize the risen Christ is a gift that the church has given us through the centuries. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a very, it's, you know, I, I want to just acknowledge the, um, maybe the disappointment that could exist in that invitation also, mm -hmm. because, um, you know, it's, I, I know at least for myself, I've got like my, uh, my religious brain or my spiritual brain and then my academic brain and then my professional brain and my friend brain and my husband, you know, all the different brains that, that we use to make it through the day. And, um, you know, the, I think the beauty of what Kim keeps inviting us back to is to see we are part of a thing that is very, very large. And everywhere you look, this invitation is coming back. When we come to liturgy on Sunday, we're part of a tradition of mass that goes back so far. When we travel to Jerusalem, we're part of a tradition that goes back so far. When we create a passion, we're part of a, a tradition that goes back so far. And I think part of the challenge or the disappointment that I'm getting at is like, for right now, the time machine doesn't exist. And so is there a way to be able to see these things in each other? And is there a way to be able to see these things in everyone? Right. Uh, all, you know, not just the people that I like, but the, the three of you sitting here who we get to hang out with and talk and, and, and find creativity with, but, you know, we, when we look at Jerusalem, we also hear the story of conflict, you know, for, at least 1500 years, but more like 2000, 3000 years where Christians and Jews and Muslims are, are, have been vying for different areas in the, in Jerusalem for a long time. And that's just as much part of the story as, you know, as Jesus, um, the, the events of his passion taking place there. But, um, we actually did get a question. I thought this would be a good time to jump in. Someone asked, can you tell us some of the places you'll be visiting? and what you'll be doing in the Holy Land outside of recording. And so I think I can give kind of the, the two or three minute Reader's Digest version um, of that. And um, the, uh, the basic idea is we, we're gonna be there for eight days and the pilgrimage gets divided into two chunks. So the first chunk is like pure pilgrimage. Um, so we're not recording yet. We're just very much focused on entering into the place we're going, getting acclimated. Um, and then the second four days, the second chunk um, is recording plus pilgrimage. Um, so um, we, we arrive in Tel Aviv and then we drive straight to next to the Sea of Galilee to Tiberias. Um, and we'll get to kind of visit some of these places that are more, uh, more north of Jerusalem. Um, and so our first day, we're really focused on Peter. Uh, and we're going to go to Capernaum. We're going to see um, uh, some of these famous places where stories about um, Peter and Jesus happen. Um, we just had the gospel a couple weeks ago of, of Jesus showing up to the apostles on the beach after they had decided to go fishing after he had risen. And, um, and we'll get to be right on that beach um, and kind of, uh, and we'll get to take a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee, just like um, the apostles did. Um, so the first day is really focused on Peter. The second day, we'll get to go to Magdala, um, which uh, is where Mary Magdalene um, is from. And then we'll get to take a hike on Mount Tabor, um, which is where the transfiguration took place. But it's especially, especially exciting to us um, because of one of the insights that I think Tristan uh, and maybe Anna or at some point had about um, 
the scene in the passion when we're in the garden and it's the same three apostles, right? Peter, James, and John travel with Jesus up Mount Tabor when he's transfigured. They also travel with him um, the night before he's crucified and they, um, they fall asleep uh, when Jesus goes off to pray. So some, some really great um, uh, material for contemplation there. Um, the next day we'll drive down to Jerusalem. We'll kind of have a, um, a Friday in the old city of Jerusalem. So we'll do the Via Dolorosa, um, the way of the cross that is, and we'll get to walk through the, the main gate of Jerusalem where, where Jesus would have entered on Palm Sunday. And um, we'll get to, get to see all of the, you know, in Jerusalem, every single event that you've heard of in the scripture is commemorated at a place, more or less. I mean, so you, you walk along and, and here we are at the place where Jesus showed the apostles the Our Father. And, um, you know, here's the tomb of, of Mary, Mother of God. And here's where the upper room was. Oh, there's maybe two places where the upper room could have been, right? So um, we get to kind of dig into these, um, these different stories that um, were developed over the years about the places that we're considering. Um, we'll get to stay at Tan Tour, um, which is a, a, a famous um, center for ecumenical dialogue, um, but is also under the care of Notre Dame. And uh, it's where Notre Dame study abroad programs are housed out of. It's also a place where Notre Dame and, and other um, institutions host scholars for um, ecumenical dialogue. Um, and we'll get, it's a very beautiful place just south of the city of Jerusalem. And we'll get to, um, it's right next to Bethlehem. So potentially walk into Bethlehem. Um, and then we get to Sunday and that's when our second chunk starts. Um, we'll get to go to um, the upper rooms on this Sunday morning and then go to the Jerusalem Music Center where, we're, where we will record. Um, the next day we'll go to Bethany, um, which is kind of where, where the passion really starts or our version of the passion starts. Um, and then on um, Wednesday or sorry, Tuesday and Thursday, we'll just do a couple other activities in and around Jerusalem before we record. But that's the kind of... Uh, the big picture arc of what our pilgrimage will look like. Um, I, I also just want to encourage you um, as you're entering questions, you could, if there's anything you'd like us to take with us to, to pray for as we go to Jerusalem, um, please feel free to use that form to put, um, put that in there and we'll make sure to bring um, any prayer intentions um, with us on our pilgrimage. But thank you so much for asking the question also. Um, I also wondered if we could kind of, uh, we had a couple things that we talked about the other day that were just so wonderful. Um, and one of the really great examples of um, kind of the, the heart of, of what we're talking about, I think, is funerals. Um, I know for me, at least, um, I've been to probably hundreds of funerals as a church musician. You know, you go and you, you, do, you call the family and you get to know them a little bit as you help them select the music. And, and there's a whole process kind of on the ministerial side. But um, but all of us have been to funerals and it's it's one of those times also where um, sometimes you're at a funeral of someone who's very close to you and, and all the feelings that you wanna feel happen in perfect synchronicity with the liturgy. And sometimes you don't know the person or you do know the person and the emotions don't happen. And, and this is, I think, just a really great example of how um, of kind of the deeper part of what we're talking about. I wondered, Kim, if you might kind of talk more about that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So again, like, you know, the, we tend to think about grief as an emotional state. Um, and I'm, I mean, it is in part, but it's not, a, it's not a simple emotional state. Um, you know, going through grief is um, a whole um, complex of emotions that come along with loss. So grief is really about the experience of loss. Um, it's not really about um, what you ought to feel. And I know people who are grieving um, sometimes, you know, get, feel like they're getting a lot of pressure from people around them, for example, to perform, you know, appropriate emotions when they might not be feeling those emotions. They're suffering loss. They're experiencing loss. They're transitioning through loss, but they might not um, always have, you know, emotional, like the emotions we expect of a grieving person. So I think one of the things that's like kind of powerful about the liturgy is again, it makes space for a range of different emotional responses because what really we need to do is come together and pray um, together with God surrounding grief. Um, it's not a situation, at least for Catholics, where you're expected to perform like 
here's the kinds of emotions people expect from me and so I have to perform those but rather it's a, a space that opens um, through scripture um, a lot of different emotional and um, and intellectual responses that we can have to the experience of, of grief and the experience of loss so it really should be something that's really freeing for people who are grieving so that they can experience grief um, in their own way uh, because the experience of loss is really different depending on you know not just like close or far but like the specific dynamics of a relationship really change the experience of loss around that person um, and so that's one thing that I think is really helpful about Catholic funeral liturgies and that's one of the things that's that means that in a way like every funeral liturgies aren't like specific to the person who's died, what they do is they open a space to like think about God and God's being together with us in our experience of loss, where God makes space for the person who's died and for our relationships for to that person to be expressed um, liturgically. Yeah, this this performative sense is so interesting because. Um, at least like um, musically. And one of the things that you said when we met the other day, Kim, really struck me in that like, we we go, we we hold ourselves to, um, to being part of the liturgy and being part of the community so that for those times when, or not so that, but um, uh, those times that we, are going to experience the things that are difficult in a sense we're kind of like trained up for them um and the thing the closest thing i could think of too is like you know and the thing that makes great music great is is when it's completely expressive and and everybody's kind of on uh unified in their intention in a way right and um we open ourselves up to that even more when we're in rehearsal when we're practicing and we can put ourselves into that environment where um, you know, it, it is in a way performative, right? It's like, I'm trying to put on something that I, that doesn't fit yet. And I wonder like, how, how do these two things go together? Yeah. And I think that's really important. I mean, we were talking about the, like, this is an invitational quality to the liturgy. So I say like the liturgy doesn't require you to have certain emotions, but it does, um, give you access to certain emotions in the same way that like, so this is something we see, I think, especially with the Psalms, like the Psalms are probably the most um, emotive part of the Bible. Um, like, and when we see this in the liturgy, we can really kind of understand. And um, Kathleen Norris writes really beautifully about this. So, and I don't, I don't want to fail to give credit here. So I'm mostly relying on her here. But when we pray, for example, a Psalm of um, repentance, a lament Psalm, um, I, right now I'm feeling fine. You know, the weather outside here in South Bend is really great. Um, you know, everything is fine here. Um, if, uh, if the liturgy of the hours or if the mass has a lament Psalm listed for today, um, what I'm really doing is I'm being invited by the church to enter into solidarity with people who are suffering and to prepare myself for the knowledge that I will also experience suffering so that I don't kind of come to assume that the natural state of things is uh, May and South Bend. Um, those <laughs> of us who live in South Bend know that, that May and South Bend is not the natural state of things in any way. Yeah. Um, but it makes me remember that like suffering is part of my experience as a human condition and the relative like goodness that I'm experiencing now um, shouldn't put me out of tune with my brothers and sisters that are suffering loss or who are in poverty or who are experiencing warfare, um, but rather should become an opportunity for me to pray with them and help them in whatever ways that's, that's possible. So I think, and I actually think you know more about this than I do as a liturgical musician, but that's my experience of liturgical music. And I think that's one of the reasons why liturgical music is so important to people is that it really offers in a very holistic fashion um, that invitation that the scriptures give us to enter into the feelings of other people. It doesn't have to be sorrow. I mean, 
there two thirds of the Psalter is lament Psalms, which is why I use that as an example. Um, but we're also called to enter into our neighbor's joy and not to like, for example, envy them because they're happy and we're not. Um, so, you know, that's also a call to us in South Bend, not to envy our <laughs> neighbors who have better weather, but. I like that language though. It's a, a call to enter in, you know, it's, it's, it's not to, to fake it necessarily or to, to put it on, but just to, to be next to or something. To... Yeah. And just to like, to make sure I'm clear, like a good performance is entering in, it's not faking it. Right. So yeah. we tend to reserve that term performance for things that are fake in our culture, but that's a mistake. Um, a good performance is entering in to the experience, not, and we know this when we think about acting and yeah, singing, I think. Yeah. But... Um, can I, I'm, I'm just reminded in this discussion and this condition of the liturgy that you're describing, Kim, um, that the actually scripture of the resurrection narratives gives us this very beautifully. I think of Mary, Mary of Clopas joining Magdalene on the route to the tomb, carrying the incense, which to me is a sort of symbol of the liturgy, walking us toward this empty tomb which is, and of course it says that Madeline gets there and she weeps, but that the empty tomb is this sort of void, is this, which, or a mirror by which any emotion is, is whatever you feel is okay, it's all contained in there. And then it brings, a, and that what liturgy does is bring us to the foot of that place and says, worship, fall to your knees, and, then, and that whatever you're going through or, or, or ready to experience or receive or give, um, there's a place for that within this, this void, this tomb. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, we got a question for Tristan. Um, can you share any of the poems or prayers that you have written for the Holy Land pilgrimage? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, <laughs> I would love to. That's a real, I can that's give a you real a piece question of one. too. I, I'm not just making that up. It really came in. There's no ringers in the audience. No, here. there's no, yeah, right. Okay, that's yeah, my mom uh, down the street. Um, yes, I can. I'll give you a little piece, actually, which I think uh, perhaps relates to what we've just been talking about. This little devotion is for the last day of the pilgrimage on Wednesday, the 25th, when we go to the, the garden tomb, um, the garden tomb, a place that commemorates where Christ's body was laid. And in this devotion, uh, it's original poetry from the perspective of Magdalene on the way, on the, on route to the tomb, but it's juxtaposed the responsorial for this, for the verses are the poetry and the, the responsorial is the refrain from Psalm 24, which is, uh, the earth is the Lord's and all it holds the world and those who dwell therein. So I'll give you a couple little pieces from that. Um, and I'll, I'll even put my hand up in the air for the response. Um, so we, we do the sign of the cross, we're at the tomb, and the speaker who, who's going to lead us, which I think is going to be a student, will say, Cast me into the deep, past the seal that breaks the stagnant air of want and rushes in delivered light this way. The earth is the Lord's and all it holds, the world and those who dwell therein. And my dwelling now, a crack in quiet, my roll a rolling through of doorway darkened by the bolt, for he founded it on the seas, established it on the rivers. The earth is the Lord, and all it holds, the world and those who dwell therein, etc., etc. It goes on like that for a while. So I'm very pumped about that one. Yeah. There's another poem that I would love for you to read too. Absolutely. I think I know what you're referring to. Um, yes. I have, okay, this is, so that one was my poem, which is pretty good. So, but don't compare it to this one, which is perfect um, <laughs> by D.H. Lawrence. It's an excerpt from D.H. Lawrence's poem called Piano. And uh, it occurred to me to, to this poem, like sort of creeped into my mind during this discussion last week with JJ and Kim and Meg about what we were going to do for this podcast. And uh, I was like a little bit nervous to even bring it up. I thought, like, is it is it this idea is so great and Kim has articulated it, articulated it so well as a theologian might. And I thought, oh, OK, like I have nothing to add here. But this poem was like, S -s -s mention me, mention me, mention me. Um, and so I did. And I thought, OK, even that's like a beautiful example of bringing something to the table, um, even if you think it won't fit. So here's this little poem by D.H. Lawrence called Piano. And uh, so here it goes. 
softly in the dusk, a woman is singing to me, taking me back down the vista of years till I see a child sitting under the piano in the boom of the tingling strings and pressing the small poised feet of a mother who smiles as she sings. In spite of myself, the insidious mastery of song betrays me back till the heart of me weeps to belong. That's the poem. It's beautiful. Yeah, I think there's, um, this is a great transition also into this question of um, uh, grieving, grieving the, the quote unquote end of this project and, um, and how that sort of connects with both uh, for Meg in particular, kind of, you know, senior, you know, seniors are leaving the, the, the people that we've looked up to are, are moving on and, and a new class of students that are now invited in to, to be the leaders of the choir. Um, and then some of the other things that, um, you know, at, at least from, from the creative perspective also, can what, what does that mean to, um, we got to talk about this a little bit last week with um, thinking about how do you know when you're done, but there's, this is a little bit of a different flavor than that question, which is like, when you see the writing on the wall and, and the, something is approaching at an end of one of its phases or the end of itself um, entirely, like what, what happens? What do we do? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think I couldn't imagine to be someone in the senior class right now, um, just because like they've seen this project all the way through. Um, they've seen it to the point it is now. Um, and many of them are, are very, hold it very dear. Um, and so watching that be passed on and maybe even one day being an audience member to it um, is a really, I think, a gift at the same time that it may feel like a loss now. Um, and I think something really, really unique about our project is that I remember going into this this past fall and being like, well, how do we tell the new people in the choir what we've been doing? Like, there's so much to say um, and they're going to come and sing it with us and perform it with us. Like, how do we do that? How do we make that work? Um, and it just kind of did um, with all of the efforts we put in. Um, we It's something that we keep getting to invite more people into. Um, and that's how it should be. You know, it feels like, like all the stuff we've been talking about with liturgy. Um, we keep getting to invite more people into this mass or the celebration um, of the passion that we've created. Um, so I'm excited for that at the same time that it feels weird. It's like, what? Kaylee won't be Mary again? And, and like, you know, just all of, the, all of those thoughts being like, it won't feel right, but it's, you know, like at the same time, it's um, a privilege to be able to invite more people into it. Mm. Kim, how is that process sacramental? The process of bringing new people in? Not well, just bringing people in, but but of letting go and moving on. Yeah, I mean, as usual, you're, you're reading my mind here. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I was thinking about that, Meg. You know, as you were saying, like, it's, it's hard to let go of this generation of leaders because you've seen their leadership like in the way that they, as like whole persons, like embody the message. Um, but that's something we're doing in the church all the time. Like all the time um, as the church, we're inviting um, new people in, we're baptizing new people, um, we're ordaining um, new people. This is the season, um, right, for baptizing and, and first communions and um, and confirmations and ordinations. And, and that's a process really of both like looking to a new generation of leaders um, who are going to teach us what it means to be church. Um, and it's a process of letting go of our like, you know, sense, whatever sense that we had, um, that we were going to get to control the meaning of what it means to be church. Um, because I remember this actually, um, I was, um, brought into full communion with the church, um, through the RCIA process when I was a college student. 
Um, and, uh, and because I was baptized in a Presbyterian church, um, and as a college student, I wanted to become a Catholic. And I remember one of the like best catechists, they were just a terrific team, but one of them told me very early on, um, the people who we initiate at the Easter vigil, um, are a sacrament. They're a sign, um, from God to us as the church that God wants the work of remembering Jesus to continue. Um, and that means that not just like that, like we're really pleased and happy and proud. Um, and we do mourn, you know, when things are changing in the church as they always are, but as sometimes we can fail to know. But it also means that we have to listen um, to those new people. So, um, this is actually, there's a, a part in the rule of Benedict where it talks about, um, inviting somebody who's been a guest in the monastery, um, to stay and become a monk, which is actually really funny because the part about in the rule of Benedict where it talks about inviting people to become monks is like, if somebody comes and asks you to be a monk, tell them no. Um, mm -hmm. and then if they ask you again to become a monk, um, you can read them the rule and then tell them no again for six months. I forget the times, but anyway, you have to like, they have to wait a long time, um, to actually join the monastery according to the rule. Um, and it's because you want to get people to give people a chance, you know, to, to opt out <laughs> this big mm -hmm. decision. Um, but when you have somebody who's been a guest in the monastery for a long time, it doesn't say to go through that process. It says, yes, if they want to become a, a member and you know their way of life, um, you should receive them because you know them. Um, and then it also says, and if they have any critiques to make of the monastic community and you respect their way of life, you should listen because God may have sent them for exactly this reason. And I think that's actually like, that's that process of like both letting go and like asking for new insights. And it reminds me actually of like where we started this podcast with wicked problems and with mm. like encouraging our young people to reflect on the wicked pro problems that face us and, and to think about, you know, where we should go from here. So mm. anyway, I didn't anticipate the rule of Benedict today, but some days it comes up. Most days it does. <laughs> Yeah, I guess one of the one of the the things also that I'm kind of taking away here at, uh, from this project is also the idea that um, you know we're kind of going through this process as a church, this this synod on synodality, um, but this idea that uh, what does it mean to become a church that listens, um, and I think that as long as the answer to that question is easy, we're not really listening. Um, and now that, you know, we've kind of, uh, we get all of the, um, in a way we get to, to really lean into this experience of creating a passion. We get to kind of do that, such a, like a, a pivotal experience of it and traveling to the Holy Land. But, um, you know, the, even the, the first year students that I talked to in the choir, like, they're saying different things than the current senior said four years ago. Mm. And the things that they're saying are still hard to hear. You know, if I actually, you know, turn my ear and, and listen, um, because they're, uh, like, like you said, Kim, the guest, the visitor, the, the person who we've welcomed in notices things that we've gotten so used to that we stopped noticing. And, um, it, you know, it's not a, it's, it's, it's not, it's not all bad, of course, right? We find our way of life and we go with it, but uh, is there a way to continually challenge ourselves, myself, I guess is, it's who I'm asking myself, but is there a way to, to continually challenge to, to find a way to listen anew? And, and it, even though it's, it's sad to move on from a particular way of doing things, um, there are new possibilities in including um, those who wanna be included. Yeah. I mean, I think that's always going to be a hard thing, but it, it is, you know, what we're called to. And, you know, is, remaining still is actually just an illusion, too. Like, you, like things yeah. don't stay still. Um, yeah. So. I mean, I don't I think, 
you know, you're at like kind of your question is like, how do we prepare ourselves like that preparation we were talking about earlier? How do we prepare ourselves for letting go of the things that like seem too close to us, like to be sacrificed? And I think like really just the way is trust. Like, mm. you know, if we trust God um, and if we trust one another, um, it's still going to hurt. Like it's still going to be hard and we're going to make mistakes, but we will actually go forward. Yeah, I, I would talk to Tristan just for a second this morning. We were talking about the feeling of this week and just how many details there are, how many things that, and not just the details, but on this trip that we're stewarding, we are shepherding, we know things are going to go wrong. But in terms of the safety preparation and, the, you know, kind of making sure everything's lined up, we've done, we've checked all the boxes, we've done the all the routines to make sure that everything is as safe as it could be. We have contingencies for contingencies, et cetera. But the, the, the reality still remains. Things will not go according to plan. And there's nothing I can really, more I can do to prepare for that except to be here now. And I think that's one of the, the, the most fun things, I guess, about this week. I mean, it's, it's also terrifying, but it's, uh, <laughs> It's, it's one way to challenge myself to stay in it. Can I say one more thing about poetry? As Kim was talking, another poem started to creep into my head. And I was like, no, 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 don't, don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. But now I think I ought to because it, it's very beautiful and it's very short and it's part of our pilgrimage. Um, is it cool, JJ, if I just give the little yeah. verse? All right. Um, it's by Jessica Powers, who was a Carmelite nun. Um, she says, measure your love by stillness. He waits. Do you as well give to his infinite patience your finite parallel? God himself is a silence, seeking a soundless will. O Spirita Sancta, be very still. When quiet has possessed you and dark has fled with dim, you on a mount of mourning will be aware of him. Love that poem because it promises us that we'll be aware of him in our in this stillness which is actually not stillness the poem describes sunrise um and so that's a kind of uh you know maybe something to chew on but um yeah thanks for letting me share that put it in the booklet <laughs> what does that say that sounds like something everyone going on the pilgrimage needs to hear it's in there i think roger that yeah it's in yeah there. <laughs> um we got one more question that i think we could take um uh, as we get ready to wrap up, but um, as you think about moving on after the passion, what other projects are on the horizon? Or will it take some time for new projects to surface? I think that yes and yes. Um, but um, the, the short answer is, um, I don't know which will kind of take hold, but some exciting things that um, we're trying to listen to, I would say, would be, um, uh, the continuing sort of mental health crisis um, that we're seeing in society writ large post coronavirus, but especially among college students, um, we we were able to um, be part of a, a day long retreat a couple of weeks ago, and some of the um, the kind of statistics are incredibly um, heart wrenching. But um, just about the types of mental health challenges that students are going through and. Uh, Kim is kind of spearheading a, um, a project to see how liturgy and community um, can act as a, um, you know, as a buoy for, for those students who are going through crisis and, and really for all of us to, to be able to share um, the experiences that we've gotten to have in liturgy and to shape liturgy in such a way so as to help um, students see it as one of the ways that they can um, build resiliency and, and, and come together in community. Um, so that's one thing that's very exciting. Um, uh, of course, uh, I think that it's uh, it's also just a reality that this year was kind of normal and also kind of not normal. And so um, one of the things that we're always listening for is, you know, how, how do we just become a better folk choir? Um, and how do we meet the needs of our newest students that are coming in um, that we don't yet know? And um, and how do we do that through, through kind of the, the ministry that we are um, committed to in, in the Basilica on, on Sunday, um, every Sunday during the semester. So 
Um, lots on the horizon, um, but we've got a very important step happening next week, which is to be able to travel to the Israel and uh, travel to Israel, travel to the Holy Land. And, um, and we're very excited about that. Um, I think uh, we can also find a way to share um, our pilgrimage booklet with you all, um, uh, if that's okay with Tristan. Um, but I think it would be a, a really lovely way to, to invite you all along. Well, we hope that you can join us two weeks from today. It will continue to live on um, YouTube. It will not be a live program, but it will still premiere or air at 1230 um, Eastern time on Tuesday, May 24th. Um, and like I said at the beginning, um, we're going to be able to really invite you into the, to hopefully a glimpse of the whole pilgrimage kind of from um, some of the, the experiences more towards the beginning of the trip and, and for you to be able to actually see some of the things that we're seeing and um, invite you into that. But um, thank you so much for, for being with us these past couple months. Um, thank you to Kim, Tristan, and Meg, our panelists for today, um, for such an inspiring conversation. And um, please feel free to um, reach out, tell a friend. Um, we'd be thrilled if you um, would share this um, series with anyone who you think might be interested. And um, we hope that you'll tune in, in two weeks from today for our uh, final episode.